Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Theater.com video, we're going to be discussing technology news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD, because the company have just released a beta driver, which is specifically geared for mining. I can already hear you groaning over the internet. The next news story will be the PlayStation 4 Pro, because there are multiple reports that the FP16 ability of the PS4 Pro will eventually allow it to catch up, perhaps even surpass the Xbox One X performance. We'll go into that quite in depth. And then we're going to finish the video with IBM Research, because the company have managed to achieve 330 terabytes of storage on a tape. That's right, because for those who don't know, tape technology is still very much used in service for backups. <clears throat> but we're going to start things out, as I said, with AMD. So, as a quick lesson, um, for those who don't know too much about mining, with Ethereum mining, one of the things that it does differently from other cryptocurrencies is it stores an awful lot of data in the GPU's local memory. And AMD have released multiple driver um, updates, and one of those has significantly reduced the performance of, mine, of Ethereum mining hash rates. Well... What this beta driver does, too long didn't read, is it actually brings performance not just back to what the old drivers had, but actually surpasses it. And a website by the name of Hot Hardware actually did a rather nice comparison. So yes, you've got Vega 56, which I guess is probably what a lot of people are going to be eyeing. Now, Vega 56 hits 29.3 with this new driver. It hits around 36.4, excuse me, point, uh, five. So in other words, it's quite a lot of difference, and obviously that is significant over several hours. That can obviously make the difference uh, long term in terms of profitability. The one thing about the Vega 56 as well is it also has another benefit. Specifically, Vega 56 is A, cheaper to purchase, and B, it's also cheaper to run because power consumption is obviously less. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this affects everything, because obviously... People are going to have to do the calculations of whether it's worth them actually running Vega 56. At the moment, it's bloody hard to purchase the card, and obviously prices are, are going to be quite uh, quite high for the Vega 64s, which are obviously on sale, but they're pretty much a paper launch at this point. So when Vega 56 becomes readily available to customers, it's going to be probably a bit of a race between gamers. Now... This is a very slight side, but I am curious to hear from you guys what you think of this. Because many are are interpreting this as, uh, well, a bit of a slap in the face to, to gamers. Ultimately, gamers are who have been waiting for this card for a long time. And now, obviously, they've been waiting, waiting, waiting for Vega. And essentially, they're being pipped to the post by miners. Now, as a, a slight aside, I don't, I don't really have anything against miners. I, like, I, that's your business, that's your money. Do with what you want. Um, but... I can understand the frustration on behalf of of, uh, of our gamers. So I, I have a feeling this is probably going to erode quite a lot of goodwill that gamers have with AMD. But on the other hand, I also don't blame AMD in the sense of, well, it's money. So obviously miners are going to buy multiple graphics cards. Most gamers ultimately are probably just going to buy one graphics card, maybe two if they're going crossfire. Obviously, this is not going to be the case with miners. If the GPU is, well, to be frank with you, profitable with mining, they're obviously going to buy three, four, five, six, or whatever graphics cards they can squeeze into their into their rig. So, in that respect, money-wise, I can understand AMD definitely wanting to appeal to that demographic. Next up, let's... Oh, goodness, I, I, I know this is going to be a bit of a controversial topic. But um, the PlayStation 4 Pro. So the PS4 Pro um, is about a year older than the Xbox One X when it finally launches. But the GPU and the CPU are significantly less powerful than the Xbox One X. So, for example, the GPU puts out around 4.2 teraflops of performance, whereas on the other hand, the Xbox One X hits around 6 teraflops. But there is one benefit that the PS4 Pro's GPU has over the Xbox One X. By the way, this is not speculation on my part. Eurogamer actually spoke to the 
um, creators of the Xbox, and of course Microsoft themselves, and Microsoft confirmed it does not have this ability, and that is that the Xbox One X cannot run to 16-bit operations in parallel. So what this means is, at least in theory, if the PS4 Pro was only running 16-bit operations, the performance doubles, so it goes to a theoretical 8.4 teraflops. Of course, you and I both know that this is not going to be the case with all games, because A, not all games run that, and B, not all workloads can be um, just basically pared down to 16-bit operations. For those who don't know, and I'm going to keep this pretty simple, the size of the bit is essentially the um, the accuracy of the operation. So 32-bit operations are considerably more accurate. Certain uh, tasks, if you will, don't really need that level of accuracy. So if a task doesn't need that level of accuracy, what you can do is just say, hey, we can we can uh, basically flag this, make it run at 16-bit, and you get obviously a performance benefit. And in the AMD ecosystem, this is known as rapid packed math. Mark Cerny did confirm quite early on in the PS4's uh, PS4 Pro's life that it did have technologies of the um, Polaris architecture and technologies behind uh, above that, so in other words, Vega. And with a video AMD released which explains rapid pack math, one of the games that was confirmed to be utilizing this, amongst another one, is Far Cry 5. So obviously this essentially means that developers are able to leverage this to improve the performance on an AMD GPU which has rapid pack math. Now there are a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. One, how many developers are really going to optimize this across multiple games. So what I mean by that is yes, okay, AMD's hardware certainly can take advantage of this, but not all GPUs will do this. For example, certain NVIDIA cards have FP16, dual FP16 support as well. But when it comes to consoles, it's a bit harder, because if a game is coming to PC, that's one thing, but if a game is not coming to PC, uh, and it's just between the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro, are developers going to rush in, spend that extra time to actually perform those optimizations? It's a bit hard to tell. The second thing is how much work can the GPU do on that specific game with FP16? Obviously, it does depend upon the game itself, and that's really where it comes down to. I mean, different games are going to be able to push at different levels of load because their GPUs are just, um, or rather the console's GPU, is just handling different tasks on that game's engine. For example, if one was to recall back to Mass Effect Andromeda, it did actually utilise, even back then, FP16 and they utilized this when it came to checkerboard rendering. Um, basically, 800, 1800p, excuse me, but checkerboard rendering was done at around 23.4 milliseconds with 1800p without checkerboard rendering. It hit 36.82, but accordingly, if they utilized the PS4 Pro's FP16, then they managed to get around 30% performance improvement. However, this is really simplifying things, and it's not just FP16, because A, what effects are going to be used, B, it also doesn't account for the rest of the specifications of the system. For example, what about the CPU? What about the memory system? Now, I'm not saying that this is not an advantage, and quite honestly, I'm really curious to know why Microsoft did not put FP16 in the Xbox One X's GPU. There's a couple of theories I've got. One, they wanted compa compatibility for whatever reason. Maybe doing this would have been a problem. Maybe they didn't have the die size. Maybe they just didn't feel it was important. Maybe they just felt that they could just do brute force. I don't know. There's there's multiple theories you could go with, but whatever. I think it was a mistake. I think they should have put FP16 in the Xbox One X because even if it's a feature that not many developers use, it's better to have it than not have it. And I think, honestly, it will be used in the future. Um, and obviously it would be great as well for developers to know that that is some um, feature that both GPUs have in both consoles. And that's really all I can say on the matter because it's going to be time will tell on this thing on how many developers are going to use it. Do I think it's going to equate to the Xbox One X's performance? Probably not. Not overall. Uh, in terms of frame rate, for example, the uh, Xbox One X just has a, a faster GP, uh, CPU, uh, so that's obviously going to be quite important. The Xbox One X does have a great deal of additional memory bandwidth as well as memory itself, and some tasks just cannot 
physically be put to FP16. But with that said, it's one area I can definitely say the PS4 Pro does have an advantage over the Xbox One X. So we're going to finish the video now. And this one I wasn't going to originally cover, but I just think it's kind of cool if nothing else. And uh, that is that IBM researchers have performed a breakthrough, a miracle. They have created a 330 terabyte tape. Now, to put that into some level of perspective, this is 201 billion bits. I'm going to repeat that one more time. 201 billion bits per square inch. Um, and is actually a record by improving recording density more than 20 times that of other commercial tape drives. Now, there are reasons that tape is still very, very, very much widely used today. One is it's pretty secure. The second is it's still quite energy efficient. That is, it doesn't really cost that much power to run the tape drives. The second, the third, sorry, not the second, is that it's actually quite cost effective. The price of tapes for the level of data backup that you actually need, after all, you're talking hundreds of gigabytes of data. Well, it's quite cheap to do that. You obviously can't just burn a whole bunch of Blu-rays. It's just way too expensive to do that. And also, Blu-rays just aren't big enough. So there is also that to consider. And it's quite cool, actually, because IBM have definitely quite the history when it comes to magnetic tape storage. In fact, over 60 years ago, they created the 726 magnetic tape unit. And it used the whole reels thing. You've probably seen those in old school movies where they had, you know, the spinning reels. And those had a capacity which was pretty big at the time. Absolutely whopping, actually. Two megabytes. I mean, think about that. Back in, like, the, the 70s and the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, that was still an awful lot of data. Anyway, uh, I realise this is not something that's probably going to impact many of you, but I just wanted to kind of throw it in just for the sake of it, really. Figured some of you would find it kind of cool. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.